to start at 718. I'm coming up, Lord. We'll do the slow start on this guy. Read your Bible, 718. If you read it well, then you'll know the story that I'm about to tell. Welcome back, students. Yeah. Good to see everybody. See if you're really right. We are. Alright, <laughs> hey, hey. wow, you passed. All right, seven thirty-seven. Thanks for not leaving me hanging on that one. <laughs> Embarrassing. All right, seven thirty-seven. I tried and I tried. Find a mask. I try and I try, I try and I try, I try and I try, until I found the Lord of my soul. Oh 
for this moment that we would able to see each other you know in person and see more than the same people as much as I love seeing the same people yeah. but to see your faces and to see what God has done throughout the last couple of months this is a victory right now um, I want to share a psalm and Psalm 145 starting in verse 3 it says great is the Lord he is most worthy of praise no one can measure his greatness let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. And I've been thinking about that the last couple of months for this moment, like I said. Because as much as we've gone through, as hardships and trials that we've seen over the last few months, God is great. God is here for us in this moment. And this is what we've been seeing. This is what we've been waiting for. So right now, because we haven't been seeing the same amount of people, I want to call up a few people uh, to share about their summers and also to introduce some new faces. Uh, so right now I'm going to have Brett, Theo, Sarah, and Max come up. And Max at the end is going to introduce us to himself. So right now, uh, let's call him up. Let's go, guys. Hello. Hello, everybody. Oh, my gosh. Just, just like Alex said, this is crazy. Like, I haven't been in this setting in too long. Like, it just feels so crazy. Um, but, yeah, great, great to see all your faces, even with masks on. Um, so, yeah, my summer was interesting. It was great. It turned out great. Um, it was definitely changed from what it was going to be prior to everything that's gone on. Um, I was supposed to be working in a hotel in Hershey, but now, well, what happened was that got canceled, and then so I stayed home for a few weeks to try to find work because um, I still wanted to try to get some experience if I could with uh, hospitality and like restaurants and stuff because that's what I study. So I waited and finally got a job at this cafe that opened up recently in my hometown, and so. Um, it was a blast. Like basically, the, the, this uh, cafe—it's like a really nice, like specialty coffee shop, but it's also got this like car theme. So you have these people bringing in their cars to kind of just come and, and and socialize. And like the owner, uh, he's a super nice guy. He he totally just like brings people in and and sort of just likes to have this interesting sort of like community with like people who uh, have these cars, and then you have you know, the coffee and everything is just like really cool. And I really enjoyed the experience. I got to be like a server and a host kind of thing. Um, so I was working at home. Um, I also got to uh, just have some good time with people from New Jersey, like people from the church there, some of my best friends that I grew up with. Um, I got to do like a little uh, trip with some brothers to uh, Lake Placid, New York. So that was a great time, lots of fun memories from that. Um, even just great to sort of be spiritually uplifted and just like praying with each other during that time. Um, and we had one nice family vacation um, in Lake George. Uh, so that was great because usually my dad doesn't get to stay the whole time, but because of his job situation, he was there. And we just got a lot of quality time as a family too, especially just even being home the whole time. So obviously it would have been, you know, great to have been here too, but I, I was grateful for what it was. And I'm just excited to be back for my senior year. So. That was my summer, pretty much. But, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. I hope you guys can hear me. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm also the same major as Brett, um, and I'm a senior this year. Um, so my summer, uh, I 
I say is like not that interesting. Um, I didn't work, um, and I say like I just got a lot of rest, and also like surprisingly like um, a lot of reading in. Like I've never done a lot of reading before in my life. Um, and mainly like I feel like I was really able to, um, I guess like catch up my time with God because like also like when I was here at school, I felt like I had so many distractions. Um, and like sometimes like I would meet up with my group um, to like see like where we are doing our quiet times, and like I felt like I was lacking at that time. Um, but like even being home, I did struggle a lot because like it was difficult to also like um, not have people there for you that easily to um, talk to you or hold you um, accountable. Um, but I guess, like, yeah, uh, I decided to dive more into the Bible, um, and I think, like, God, like, definitely started, like, opening my eyes, and I, um, uh, like, it was nice, like, being able to, I guess, um, learn how to pray and, like, spend a lot of time in prayer with Him, um, especially with, like, everything that's, that was going on, like, around us, um, I think, like, that really got to me, and, uh, at times, like, I felt like I got into this depressed mood, um, just hearing all this, like all these horrible things and all the negativity. Yeah. And there were like sometimes there would be um, like when I saw some of my family members, um, they were like sometimes fighting with each other, where I would get involved, um, and then I I lost sight of God and started um, I guess also acting out and like. Also because like this was just making us all like anxious. Um, yeah. But then like I was kind of like disgusted with myself how I acted. So um, I was able to then just like I realized like no I need God. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, then the cool thing was I told my I was able to like come openly to my mom about like what I was feeling and going through. And like also like we were able to really like talk about God and um, I thought like because we never like were that comfortable I would say like I never really knew where her faith was but I knew she believed in God um, and then like I also was able to um, spend a lot of quality time with my dad because like growing up I um, like bonded with him only like over sports or like basketball because he was like the coach but we never really talked like deeply about things. Um, but I learned he has like a lot of knowledge I could go to for him to share with me about God as well. So yeah, I think like, I'm just happy um, things like ended on good terms with my family. Yeah. So yeah. All right, hey guys, I'm Theo. If you don't know yet, um, this has been my sophomore year here, and this summer. I had the privilege to serve at The Forge by Hope for Kids. It's a camp uh, just about an hour outside of Philadelphia. And that took up pretty much every minute of my summer. And it was uh, I mean, it was a blast, though. I got to be outside serving with about 30 other disciples uh, my age and college age from basically all over the country, which was really cool, especially during this um, COVID season. I could have been at home on my computer, but I was got to be outside doing a bunch of different things. Yeah. Um, and the summer really started out with a lot of just physical maintenance work and stuff like that. But as it started to get going, we added on, we had to do fundraising for the camp because we didn't get all of our um, income that we have. We also had to do, we had the opportunity to do virtual camps. And those range from, okay, like we normally have um, people from within different churches co across the, the East Coast come and send their kids. So we did that virtually, but we also were able to do, um, uh, we could do Camp Miracles virtually, and that has kids from inner city Philadelphia. They normally come to the camp, but we got to do it virtually, so and we got to reach out to them. That way was really cool. Um, we also hosted a day camp there, and we also got to do um, a lot of bonding with each other as well, with all the staff there. And basically, those things were all saying, like, I'm the most important thing, so it was a lot of stuff to handle, um, but it was a fantastic summer. I got to um, learn a ton of new things, even just about my own limitations. And what I can handle, I was got to serve as the activities director, and that means I'm in charge of all the activities on camp and everything that uh, the people are doing. And normally it's a 
more intensive job because you have the camps there and that's I'm in charge of all their stuff but I got to manage um, just the staff and how we serve the day camp and pretty much the day camp was there um, paying for our rock wall and zip line and pool and that's what I'm in charge of so that was pretty much my summer making sure that everything ran smoothly for them make sure we are COVID safe um, but also learning that okay I can't expect myself to handle all of it yeah. um, I mean definitely the first couple weeks and first days I was like okay I need to be everywhere at once I need to make sure everybody um, knows what they're doing has the stuff they need to do just right um, but I definitely got to learn and just see how much I can rely on other people um, and even just like trust okay if something goes wrong we'll fix it I mean we have a fantastic staff yeah. um, even just looking at the past summer like we were asked to do so many different things and they handled it fantastically and it was cool just to be able to to put my trust in people and then see it actually met and have them like exceed my expectations in that way and I couldn't be more grateful I got to spend my summer there um, but yeah that's what I did this summer happy to be here well, what's up everybody uh, my name is Max uh, Geating and I come from Hershey Pennsylvania the sweetest place on earth I will move over here because it's centered um, and I I'm studying finance right now. I'm a upcoming junior, and I'm just super excited uh, to worship with you guys. Um, and this summer, I it's been a summer of a lot of growing and a lot of learning. I uh, had an opportunity to work with a team uh, out in Australia um, online. Thank God, and um, but it it resulted in some crazy hours. So it definitely stretched me physically and mentally. Uh, through that time, and there, there have also been times where, uh, you know, I guess Satan was really coming after my family, and it's like, there's just been a lot of growth in that aspect as well. Um, so I'm really excited to start and keep in the fight with you guys, and uh, I can't wait to see what God is going to do in this ministry. Well, thank you all for sharing. Uh, right now I'm going to go to God in prayer, and we'll move on to our service. Uh, God, thank you so much that uh, we are here together right now, God, that we can uh, see you for being so sovereign, God, and that we can see you in our lives as a father. I pray that you protect us as we move forward and as we try to balance our lives in the new world, uh, God. I pray that you can continue to be the constant in our lives and that you grant us uh, just times so that will be for refreshing. Uh, and it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning to you guys on Zoom. Uh, we've got five or six folks on Zoom. It's great to see everybody's, I'm assuming, smiling faces behind the masks. You kind of have to interpret it through the, you know, the eye squint that we're all smiling. I'm going to assume that. It's great to have the Hershey boys in town. Yeah. Good to see you guys. Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. Um, it is a breath of fresh air when the students come back. Uh, <laughs> however long or short uh, in-person classes are going to be, it's great to enjoy this moment here right now where we get some fellowship and we do it safely. I'd just like to throw this out there. Uh, go ahead and have fun. Go ahead and make the most of your time on campus and for my kids, you know, going back to in-person school. But just be wise. Just be smart. Be cautious. All of those good things. Amen. Um, so we've been all, all year, really, we've been talking about kingdom culture. And we started out in the Sermon on the Mount. And we just marched word by word through Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And all summer, we've continued sort of that theme of kingdom culture, uh, primarily looking at the parables of Jesus. And we're going to do that again in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, and, and the idea of parable we've talked about before uh, you could think of it as a riddle to be solved, uh, a story that's meant to make you think and make you say, hmm, everybody try that, say, hmm, hmm, that's right. That's how you should feel when you hear or read a parable. You should think, hmm, what does this mean? But another idea of a parable, more of a Greek idea of a parable, is a comparison, as in you have a story that's meant to be compared and a reference point to an actual thing, whatever, whatever the teacher wants you to think about. 
Uh, and it's almost as if you lay one thing as a reference point side by side another thing to compare. Uh, if you shop on Amazon, maybe you've noticed that, that sometimes people will have um, you know, a ruler or a little coin or something like that as a reference point to the thing that you're thinking about buying. Several years ago, uh, I was a newbie to purchasing things on Amazon. And uh, this was when I was living in Philadelphia. The entire Philly church decided to read a book. Uh, and I decided I'm not going to buy the book from the church because I bet I can get it cheaper on Amazon. And I found it for about $5, which was, I think was half price. And I was like, click, I'm going to buy that. Very quick decision. Seemed really obvious. Waited eagerly in the mail. And when I opened it up, I was really surprised. Because the book that we were going to study for about a month was, no lie, this big. <laughs> It was a teeny, tiny little book, and it was only sort of a summary of the entire book. And I was, I was going to have to preach and teach from this book. And so I was trying to read it like this, no lie, because I didn't think about a reference point. Let me compare what, this picture to something else. Uh, that was a mistake. It's good to have a reference point. Otherwise, you're going to be doing this thing, right? Uh, so Jesus... Jesus does this many, many times in Matthew as he's telling parables. One of the shortest parables. He says, hey, think about, think about Solomon. Think about Solomon in all his splendor. Think about Solomon with all of his family extended, all of his wives, all of his wealth, all of his gold, all of his palaces. You want to compare him to something? Think about this flower. The flower wins every time. Jesus says in Matthew 6, Solomon in all his splendor doesn't even compare to a lily of the field. Think about that. That's, that's kind of crazy, right? But it's a reference point. Jesus is trying to say, we can, we can be a little bit impressive with all of our striving and all of our accumulation, but really when we have the right reference point, we're, we're just not that impressive. We're not that big a deal. Uh, we, we may not feel like that. We might feel like we have a bit of a reputation. But with the right reference point, we're, we're, we're smaller than we tend to feel. Uh, Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom. The kingdom in Matthew chapter 20. And he uses a story or a reference word, a parable, about workers in a vineyard. And I think he's going to teach us a couple of things. One, our splendor is not that big. Two, the kingdom of God runs on his generosity, not on our merit. It's not a meritocracy. The kingdom of God runs on God's generosity. And what I think Jesus is going to do is inspire us with how much God values all of us. I think he's going to remind us that God saves us for a purpose. And when he saves us, it's not just randomly. He saves us for a purpose, for meaning, gives us direction. And find, gently remind us that we need to be humble before God and before other people. So he's going to inspire us, inspire us with his words. He's going to remind us that God saves us for a purpose. And finally, he's going to gently remind us that we need to approach God and everyone else with some humility. Let's read chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20. Just for a little bit of reference, if you will, in chapter 19... Some children approach Jesus. And some of the disciples are like, ah, get out of here, kids. You know, ugh, get out of here, kids. Um, and Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Let, let the children come. Because this is who the kingdom belongs to. Uh, and, and right after that, a rich young ruler comes up to Jesus. And we all know this story. That guy walks away sad. Someone who's very impressive walks away sad. He just welcomed children and then almost essentially chases off someone who's very impressive, who kind of has a, a big reputation and big idea of himself. And at the end of that interaction, he says, in the kingdom of God, the first will be last and the last will be first. And after that statement, he goes directly into this parable, Matthew chapter 20. So read along with me here. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing.
standing in the marketplace doing nothing. To those men, he said, you also go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went off about noon. And at three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, five in the afternoon, 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they said. You also go in my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, he told them, uh, excuse me, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers to give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired, about five, came, they received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more. But they also received one denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These men, these last men, put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on one denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own business? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus is making a comparison. He has the kingdom of God and he tells this parable side by side so that we have a reference point, something to think about in reference to the kingdom of God. Uh, if you haven't been here in person or even on Zoom this summer, uh, most of our Sundays have, have been very interactive. And so I'm going to ask some thinking questions and also some discussion questions. And please feel free to interact and to talk. Sometimes uh, when people give sermons, it's, it's like a lecture and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but we found, especially in this setting, it's good. It's really, really beneficial to actually chew on these scriptures and, and contemplate them and discuss them together so that we can have sort of a plurality of understanding and viewpoints. And so, as I ask questions, you can think about it. Don't feel obligated, but also if you have something to say, feel free to discuss that and share that with everyone else. My first question is a rhetorical question, which means don't share, just think. That's what that means, okay? What does Jesus mean the last will be first and the first will be last? Don't answer Think about it. What does Jesus mean? The last will be first and the first will be last. Because he starts out saying that. And he ends saying that. And he also puts it in the middle of the parable. In this parable, he hires people first. And then he pays them last. And he does it on purpose. He makes the workers, the ones who were hired first, sit there and watch him pay all the people who came after them. What does it mean? that the last will be first and the first will be last. And what does that say about the kingdom of God? What does it illuminate to us about the kingdom of God? I want to highlight a few things before we get into the discussion part. And, and one is that the owner in this story is generous. And hopefully, to that, we all say, Amen. Right? Isn't it, isn't it fantastic that the kingdom runs on the generosity of God and not on our own merit? We like to think that we are in a meritocracy in America, and whether that's true or not, I'm not here to debate that. But we like to think that way. Uh, and, and sometimes we bring that into the kingdom, and we think that the church should operate as a meritocracy. But Jesus says, no, that's not how this works. You don't, you don't live and die in the kingdom on your own merit. Because in the kingdom, this whole thing runs on the generosity of God. Amen to that. Let me ask you this, and this is non-rhetorical, you can, you can answer here. What were these workers in this story? What, what were they doing before they were called? Yeah, nothing. Literally, it says nothing three times in the story. Why are you standing around doing nothing? Well, uh, I don't know. Nobody gave me anything to do. <laughs> At nine, 
and at 12, and at 3, and at 5, there were groups of people just standing around in the marketplace doing nothing. When they were hired, they were given something. They were nobodies. Maybe that's a little harsh, but I think it's true based on the story. And the owner made them somebody. And in the same way, that's what happens in the kingdom of God. We may think that we were a little bit of a big deal before we became Christians. We may think that, and that's fine. Until you have the right reference point, and you realize, actually, we're all kind of small. <laughs> we're, all, we're all kind of little when we're compared to the right thing. But in the kingdom, we have value. And it's not based on our merit. So, because of that, we have equal value in the kingdom. If it were a meritocracy, then there would be a hierarchy of value. But that's not the case. Because it doesn't run on a meritocracy. It runs on the generosity of the owner of God. The workers were doing nothing. Isn't it funny, though, how the ones who were hired at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. early, early in the morning, they, they weren't doing anything either. They, they were there to work. They were there to get hired. And yet, at the end of the day, at pay time, rather than think, I just got to work all day in a meaningful way. I just earned a day's wage. I earned fair pay for fair work. Instead of that, they think, we bore the heat of the sun and the burden of work all day long. Their perspective changed because they had the wrong reference point. Do you see that? They were looking at what other people got paid instead of what they were doing beforehand. Nothing. Standing around waiting to get hired. If we don't have the right reference point, we become prideful, ungrateful, entitled, and bigger in our minds than we are in reality. If we have the wrong reference point. Instead of grateful, humble, willing to do whatever. This is one of the principles of the kingdom of God. That we do not live in the church. We do not live in a meritocracy. We live by the generosity of God. Let me ask you this. And I'd like to spend maybe the bulk of the time thinking about and discussing this idea. In this story, who do you relate to? When you read this, what do you feel? Because I'm sure we feel something and we relate to someone in this story. Who do you relate to in this story? And, and let's be honest about this. Again, non-rhetorical, you can, you can talk about that one. Yeah, and the world definitely operates on different principles than the, the kingdom does. So isn't it interesting? It, it, we cannot miss this point because the, what I'm about to say is the very reason Jesus tells this story in the way that he does. Isn't it interesting that all of us assume we're the first workers? We all assume we're more deserving. We all relate to those people in the story. Who's to say that's us? Who's to say that we're the ones working longer and harder? Nobody. But that's who we relate to. That's the very reason Jesus is telling this story. Because we're, he knows in our nature we're all going to assume we were the first workers. That we were there all day. We were bearing the heat and the burden of the work all day long. Nobody, maybe not nobody, very few people assume they were the ones hired at 5 o'clock. Because then you don't get to take credit for anything. You get credit for nothing. You showed up and you got a day's wage. None of us relate to that. Because we assume that somehow we are more deserving. Oh my goodness, that's the very reason Jesus tells this story in the way that he does. Yeah. To challenge our assumptions about ourselves And our assumptions that somehow we merit some generosity from God. We merit some wage. Do you remember what Paul said our wages are? The wages of sin is death. What are you earning? What merit? Death. But what do you get in the kingdom of God? Value. Life. Purpose. Meaning. Direction. A calling. Not only now, but eternally. 
Let me think about this. Let, let, let's try and extend this story a little bit, okay? The people who got a, a fair wage, worked all day, and they got a day's wage, and yet they, they walked away feeling that somehow they were slighted versus the people who showed up at 5 o'clock Work for one hour. By then, it's probably like cleaning up the tools or something. I don't know. Never worked in a vineyard. Maybe it's squishing the grapes. That'd be kind of fun. Which of those two groups are more likely to show up the next day? The, the last ones. As a matter of fact, I bet they would be first in line. Wouldn't they? The, the point here is that perspective is so, so vital to our own faithfulness yeah. in the kingdom. Yeah. If, we, if we take the perspective that we are entitled, we're somehow deserving, we've earned something from God, we are less likely to show up the next day and the next day and the next day. And we're much more likely to start thinking about other job offers, <laughs> other opportunities, other things that are you somehow are more deserving and that are going to be based on your merit for getting the wage that we really deserve yeah. but if we can relate if we can choose to take on the perspective of the one hired at five that everything that we have is a gift from God that we are totally undeserving and what a privilege it is just to be in the vineyard we're much more likely to show up tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that no matter the other offers that come along. Jesus is challenging us in this story to have the right reference point. Relate yourself. Choose to feel like the one who was hired at 5 o'clock instead of the one who was hired at 5, 5 a.m. versus 5 p.m. Because the principle that the kingdom of God runs on is his generosity, not our merit. God gives us value. One of the things that was offensive to the workers who had been there all day, what, what he says here is, you made us equal to the ones who were hired at five. And the owner goes, yep, that's exactly right. I gave you equal value. That's exactly right. Is that offensive to you? Let's talk about that for a second. Why? Why is it offensive to think that we're valued equally, not based on our merit. Now, let's remember the context in which this story was told. Little children come to Jesus, and the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and they both brought the same stuff. Nothing. Nothing. And to one of those groups, he said, you're going to be something. The other walked away in the same state that he had approached. Nothing. Because all of his stuff really amounted to nothing, and yet it kept him out of the kingdom. Because of his entitlement. Because of his pride. Because of his perceived reputation. We're called, Jesus is calling us to humble ourselves before God. To gratefully remember that this whole thing runs on his generosity, not on our merit. And, and rather than making us feel bad about ourselves, hopefully that makes us feel like, no, God really did choose us. God has committed to choosing us over and over and over again. And maybe for those of us who have been Christians for a little while now, Jesus is calling us to remember that we're not still here because of us. Because even when we're not faithful, God is still faithful. Even just being here and lasting another day and another day is a privilege given from God. We have a part in that, of course. But as soon as we start thinking more about our part in it, we become the entitled, ungrateful, oh, this is so hard, I'm bearing under the burden of this gift. Maybe th for those of you who are younger Christians, you come to this whole thing, the kingdom and Christianity and discipleship, feeling a little bit insecure about your impact and your potential. But I'd like to remind you that when you were called, Jesus gave you a purpose and meaning and direction, meaningful work that we're all called to lean into. 
And, and what a privilege it is to be in the kingdom. If you're not yet a Christian, God is offering you that. That it doesn't have to be about your work and your striving and your ability, but instead you get the opportunity to be valued by God. Valued equally to the most faithful person you could think of. For all of us, I think Jesus is reminding us, God values us. God chooses you and me. God directs you and me. God has a calling and a purpose, meaning, direction, work for you and me. We get to show up today, tomorrow, and the next day and continue to have this meaning and purpose and direction. And we also are called, I think, to remember that God values everybody else That's right. the way that he values us. That we're all really supposed to relate to the ones who are hired last. Because the last will be first, and the first will be last. As we close out here, one of the practical applications for this idea, for this reference point, this comparison, is that we as a church... Uh, I mean, this is, a, this is an insecure time for anybody who's trying to plan anything in the future, right? And yet, we're going to do that because we have faith. We're doing some restructuring and reorganizing. And one of the things that we're doing is uh, we're going to have everybody in the church as a part of a committee. And all, all that means is you have some direction, some purpose, something to help make the church grow, to help the church mature. There's lots of various committees there's finance, there's the encouragement committee, and they've already started, as you can see, thanks to Lana and the rest of the encouragement committee for bringing all these refreshments for all the students and everybody else, by the way, but really to celebrate the students. There's the facilities committee. There's the um, community engagement committee. There's the diversity and inclusion committee. And we can probably come up with some more as well. Uh, but the goal would be for every person, every member of the church to be a part of the committee and help make the church happen, help mature the church and help the functions of the church. That's one of the ways that we can all see our value and add value to the group. Amen. So we're going to talk more about that in the coming future. Um, and what we're going to do now, actually, is have communion together. And we're not going to pass trays. Uh, hopefully, you brought your own communion. Uh, if you didn't do that, there may be some folks who have some extra. It doesn't have to be cracker and juice. You can... Eat a snack, you know, chew some bubble gum, whatever. The point is that we share some food and drink and take the time and opportunity to remember all the things that Jesus has done in our lives, uh, all that he's called us to, and all that he is. So why don't we pray, and then we'll have a time of uh, reflection as we take communion. Uh, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, that he's the trailblazer, that he went before each one of us that he's called each one of us. Help us to live uh, with, with him at the forefront of our minds. Help us to remember him in every decision that we make and every day of our lives. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. meditation if you wish to join us we'll sing 457 when my love to christ grows weak 457 when my love to christ grows weak when for deeper faith i see I go to thee, God. 
as we close out, just a couple of announcements. One, you can uh, you can give contribution on tithely. We're not going to be uh, still collecting. Um, we're not passing the trays right now to collect, but you can give online or through the app tithely. Just search the Nittany Church. Um, also, we're going to have a leaders meeting uh, from 12:30 to 1:30 today. Uh, from 11:30, which is now well, you know, plus a few minutes. From now until 12, we're going to have encouragement and uh, frivolity and mirth brought to you by the encouragement <laughs> committee. Uh, and there's also a, a meetup for the students, yeah, right? 12 to 12:30. We'll just meet right out there for just a short meeting and yeah, right before the leaders meet. Great. Why don't we close in a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, God, thank you so, so much for your love, for your calling, for your generosity. Thank you for the blessing of the fellowship of believers that we get to experience here in our faith community, the Nittany Church. Help us to live up to that calling that we've already received from you. Bless our fellowship and the fun and all of the meetings and planning. And God, please keep us all safe. Uh, help us to have the right uh, balance of caution, precautions, and faith and boldness as we move forward into what still will be some strange days. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're dismissed. <laughs>